the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We celebrate today the 24th Sunday after Pentecost. This is the last Sunday of the Christian, of the Catholic Church year. Next Sunday will be the first Sunday of Advent, and so next Sunday <coughs> we will actually begin a new liturgical year. We can say that this is the last Sunday of 2019, for the Christian Church begins counting 2020 on the first Sunday of Advent. And the readings for this Mass are frightening at first glance. We are told that when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place, then those who are in Judea should flee to the mountains. Now the abomination of desolation is a fascinating biblical theme. In the Old Testament, it almost always refers to idolatry or the setting up of idols. And in the Old Testament, we are told that the man of iniquity, whoever that is, will come into the temple of God and set up idols, that he will therefore deface or defile the holy place, the temple of God, and the people will be scandalized and the people will depart. This reading of the gospel tells us about what is coming for the world. <coughs> you and I know that the world is these days in a precarious predicament. There are wars and rumors of wars. There are political instabilities in virtually every country. In our own country, we see a radical polarization between the political parties called the Democrats and the Republicans. We see also the rising up of such strange things as movements called Antifa. They call themselves anti-fascists, but they wear black clothes and cover their faces and they do nothing but terrorize innocent citizens. That's in our country today. In our country, we see a political and uh, agenda that's propagated in the media, even with refreshment companies like Coca-Cola giving a, a commercial, a television commercial right now running about a mother helping her son to cross-dress. And we see totally unscientifically founded theories that make no sense whatsoever, such as transgenderism. There's no such thing. There is gender dysphoria. There's no transgenderism. Uh, we also see strange philosophies that are not grounded in reason or in truth. Most people have forgotten in our country and in other countries the principle of non-contradiction. It is the very first principle you study if you study philosophy. A thing cannot be and not be at the same time and in the same way. A thing cannot be and not be in the same time and in the same way. This principle has to be applied to everything in our lives and in basic logic huh? and reason. So we see that happening in the world. We see political intrigue and instability in other countries, talks of wars and rumors of wars. But we also see things happening in the church where we see pseudo-Christs arising. We hear of, of priests running around speaking about the same-sex marriage as a potential, as something that could be done and should be done. We hear hierarchs running around speaking about the giving of the sacrament of Holy Communion to those who live in habitual sin. We see others running around talking about redefining the sacrament of holy orders so that uh, women may be ordained, which is fallacy, of course. Uh, we hear all kinds of other uh, topics that give all of these things, uh, give to us a sense of confusion and instability. And these are the things that are being talked about by our blessed Lord as signs that something is going to happen. 
And so in this gospel today, he begins to speak about these things. When you see idols set up in the church of God, flee, get out of there. Uh, For then will be great tribulation, such as not been seen since the beginning of the world. Mark my words, the tribulation is only just beginning for us. It's only just beginning. And then he says that (coughs) that even the elect could be deceived were these times not cut short for us. And then he begins to give us frightening signs of what will happen. But at the end of this gospel, he begins to give us good news. He says, stand up, be erect, focus on God, your vindicator who will come. What do we do in these confusing times? The epistle tells us what to do. We have been praying for you unceasingly and asking that you be filled with the knowledge of the will of God in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We must not let confusion overwhelm us, not in the church, not in the world, for we have the gospel of our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our first beginning and he is our last end. He can neither deceive nor be deceived. And if we stand firm in his holy word as the church has taught it, we shall be safe. We have other things. We have the teachings, the perennial, unwatered down teachings of the Catholic religion that come to us over 20 centuries, defined by the church, explicated and expounded upon by the holy pontiffs. These teachings are true. They cannot be changed. No priest can change the teachings of the Catholic religion. No bishop can change the teachings of the Catholic religion. No pope can change the teachings of the Catholic religion. We have those things. The Catechism of the Council of Trent. We have the weapon most powerful, referred to by so many saints as the great, great uh, strength in the battle. We have the most holy rosary. We have all of these things that help us to be filled with the knowledge of the will of God and spiritual wisdom. While we can, we must avail ourselves to the most holy sacraments daily, if possible, to receive the most holy Eucharist, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord, to go regularly to confession so that we may walk worthily and please God in all things. And what we can do in these confusions confusing times is bear fruit bear fruit in every good work how do we do that by witnessing to the truth and letting our lives be that witness to speak the truth to speak it boldly and charitably but to speak the truth and to put into practice all of the principles of our religion May you be completely strengthened through his glorious power unto perfect patience and long-suffering. Yes, we must suffer these times. Joyfully rendering thanks to the Father. As Catholic Christians, we must never lose our sense of humor. Be frightened of Catholics who have lost their sense of humor. We must always be joyful in our blessed Lord, who has made us worthy to share in the lot of the saints in light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and he has transferred us in to his kingdom. So as we end the church year, we must do so soberly, (coughs) bearing in mind that there are signs, there are great signs of portents and tumult among the nations and in the church. We must also end the church year recognizing that our blessed Lord will come. The first time he came as a savior and a redeemer, the second time he comes as judge and Lord of all. We remember these things and with sobriety of mind and heart, we give ourselves over to living and loving our Catholic faith, our traditional faith. Nobody can take it from you, only you can give it away. So know the teachings of the Lord. Spend the next days in prayer, asking him to enlighten your mind and your heart 
so that there be no confusion. Read your catechism, read the Holy Scriptures, say the Holy Rosary every day, and if possible, receive the Most Holy Eucharist frequently. If we do these things, then those last words of the Gospel will make more and more sense to us that uh, where he says, uh, um, and he will send forth his angels with a trumpet and a great sound, and they will gather his elect. You see, you and me, we want to be part of the elect. Gather the elect from the four winds, from, the four, from one end of the heavens to the other. So we stand erect waiting for him. And let us end this year loving him, praising him, giving our hearts, our minds, and our very beings over again to our traditional, holy, Catholic faith. The only way we can be saved is through that holy faith. And next Sunday we'll begin a brand new year, and may it become for us a year of grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.